Um, so we're living in this really um, important and interesting moment around what I call the new regime of data analytics, but it goes by a lot of names, right? Um, algorithmic decision making, automated decisions, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, sort of depending on what people are interested in and where their funding has come from, uh, is coming from. They um, call it something different. Um, all I'm trying to say is there's a lot of really great work out there right now that is um, thinking deeply about issues around database discrimination and the role data plays in either, in ch either challenging or um, making the inequities of our lives um, worse. Um, so what I want to do is rather than spend time telling you sort of the big, big picture, um, I want to spend a little time telling you how my work's a bit different than the other work um, that's out there. And one of the things that's different is that I ground these tools in history and in political context, because often we talk about these tools about um, as, as if they're sort of the monolith in 2001, right? And they just sort of like fell from the sky and landed in a, on like a blank slate. Um, when in fact the history of these tools is really important to understanding how we end up getting the tools we get. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk a little bit about, and thank you, Dana, for prompting this, is um, one of the things that was really important to me in this project was talking first and starting from the point of view of those folks who are the targets of these systems, who in my book, since I talk about public services, are majority poor and working class families across the color line. And often they're left out of these conversations, even when we're quite explicit about caring about inequities or caring about discrimination. Um, sometimes we don't always talk to the folks who um, face the pointiest end of that stick. So I wanted to make sure to bring their voices into the room. Um, the folks I talked to in my reporting, over 100 interviews, were very, very brave in sharing their stories with me. And I, I, I really want to um, treat those stories with the respect uh, that they deserve. So uh, a quick, uh, a very quick history lesson. There is a chapter in the book, if you decide you want to read it. Um, that basically brings us from the county poorhouse of 1819 up to what I call the digital poorhouse today. And it's like a 25 page romp through the history of poverty policy in the United States. Um, used to be like an 85 page um, romp and then my editor got to it. Um, so it's a lot more readable now. So if Elizabeth, if you're here, thank Elizabeth for that. Um, and I'm really only gonna talk about sort of one moment in this history. Um, which is the moment that I talk about as the rise of the digital poorhouse. Um, and the thing that's important about this moment is even when I started this work, I assumed that the sort of digitization of public services happened around the passage of um, the welfare reforms of 1996 that required that um, local offices computerize and automate some of their processes. Um, so I went to the New York State Archives and I started looking for the tech specs for when that change happened. So I like looked at 96, it wasn't there. I was like, oh yeah, New York State, we're always ahead of the time. So we must have done it like five years earlier. So I look back at 1990, it's not there. I look back in 1985, it's not there. I look back at 80, it's not there. And I just keep going and going and going until I find the moment where we really see these tools um, arrive. And that's actually in the, light, the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and what was happening in the late 60s and early 70s that really created this moment is the National Welfare Rights Movement. Um, the National Welfare Rights Movement was an incredibly successful um, uh, uh, group of organizations and individuals coming mostly out of the civil rights movement who pushed for equal access to public um, resources through public assistance programs. And um, one of their major strategies was a legal strategy in overturning um, a number of discriminatory eligibility laws um, or rules that had existed inside public service. Um, things like um, the man at house rule, which meant that if you were, um, if you were a single mom um, and you had any kind of relationship with a man, that man became financially responsible for your children. Um, uh, man, of, man in house also made it possible for caseworkers to um, uh, engage in sort of midnight raids of your house to check if there's a man around, right? Um, suitable home rules also um, gave folks a lot of access to your home to check that you were uh, maintaining a suitable home for your children. Um, residency restrictions um, and what was called employable mother, which basically was a rule that said if you could work in domestic service or in agriculture, meaning largely African American and Latino women, Women, um, then your paid labor was more important to the country than your labor raising your children. Um, and so since you are an employable mother, 
um, you were um, uh, expected to work and um, barred from public assistance. Um, so the national welfare rights movement takes on these um, rules and has an incredible string of successes, overturning most of them as unconstitutional and for what I think is the first time in history, um, expanding the basic constitutional rights that professional middle class people enjoy to poor and working class people and um, often uh, to um, unmarried moms and to uh, women of color um, who are mothers as well. Um, at the same time, um, we're seeing a backlash against the civil rights movement and the gains of the welfare rights movement um, and, a, and a recession. And so these elected officials and the bureaucrats face this moment where um, it is now legally impossible to discriminate uh, explicitly against folks who are looking for public assistance. Um, and yet public opinion, um, professional middle class public opinion, is um, shifting very quickly. And so they're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. And part of my argument is they um, solve this political problem by um, commissioning this massive um, new set of administrative technologies um, that include things like number matching, fraud detection, um, digital surveillance, um, and all these other tools that we see coming up in um, uh, the late 60s and early 70s. And just really quickly, um, what we see almost immediately, this is the point at which um, the welfare administration technology is um, implemented. Um, and we see an almost immediate drop in the ability of folks um, to access the um, entitlements um, to which uh, they should have access. Um, and this, it's important to understand that this happens way before the cultural narrative changes. So Reagan's welfare queen speech doesn't happen until 1976. Um, and way, way before the legislation happens, which is 20 years later in 1996. But we already see the beginning of the drop happen really at the moment that these tools are integrated. Um, so I'm not gonna spend more time on the history there. Um, I just think it's really important for people to understand the context in which these tools arose, because it helps us understand the kinds of tools we get when we look at the tools that we have now. And I tell three stories in the book. I tell a story of an attempt in the state of Indiana to automate all of the eligibility processes for their um, cash assistance program, TANF, for food stamps, and for Medicaid. And that happened in 2006. I tell the story of an electronic registry of the unhoused in Los Angeles that um, happened in 2013 that they call the Match.com of Homeless Services. Um, and I tell the story of a predictive model that's currently being used, just started in the last year, being used in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, on the home of Pittsburgh, um, to predict which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future. Um, so those are the three stories I tell. I'm only going to talk about the first and the third, because um, I think it'll give us enough of a taste um, of what's happening to have a really good conversation. Um, so Indiana... Um, the state of Indiana entered into a $1.16 billion contract with a coalition of high-tech companies that was led by IBM and ACS in 2006. Um, the goal was to automate all of the eligibility for their welfare programs, and they did this by replacing state caseworkers with um, online forms and uh, regional call centers that were staffed mostly by private employees of ACS. Um, but they also importantly did it by replacing what had in the past been a case-based or a family-based system, where a caseworker would um, uh, be sort of responsible for a family through their um, interaction with the public service system to what was called a task-based system, where um, rather than having a local caseworker, you had a worker at one of these call centers who was seeing a list of tasks um, drop into a queue, and they just responded to whatever, ta they were required, in fact, to respond to whatever task was next. Um, um, and it was... I can't make an argument about intention, but it was pretty effective at breaking the relationships between caseworkers and recipients um, in a way that had really profound consequences for folks um, seeking to access public assistance. Um, this was really the biggest disaster that I talk about in the book, um, or the most straightforward disaster. About a million applications were denied in the first three years of a 10-year project. Um, that was a, f a f more than 50% increase in denials in the three years before that project. Um, and uh, it, it went so badly, actually, that the state of Indiana broke the contract. 
um, with IBM. IBM then sued the state of Indiana for breach of contract, and in the early part of the legal battle won, um, so uh, that the, they kept the 400 plus million dollars that they had already collected on the contract and then were awarded $50 million in um, uh, penalties as well. That has since gone into arbitration and gotten a little bit more complicated, um, but it was a real mess. <clears throat> But I just want you to hear a little bit from one of the people I write about and about her experience with this system. Um, and I also want to give you a sense of what the book kind of sounds like. Um, so I want to tell you a, a little bit about Omega Young. In the fall of 2008, Omega Young of Evansville missed an appointment to recertify for Medicaid because she was in the hospital suffering from terminal cancer. The cancer that began in her ovaries had spread to her kidneys, breast, and liver. Her chemotherapy left her weak and emaciated. Young, a round-faced, umber-skinned mother of two grown sons, struggled to meet the new system's requirements. She called the Vanderburg County Help Center to let them know she was hospitalized. Her medical benefits and food stamps were still cut off for failure to cooperate. Um, and that was largely how people lost their benefits, was a sort of catch-all term, failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility, which basically meant that you had missed an appointment, you had missed a signature on, a, on, a, um, on an application, and these are applications that run anywhere from 12 to 120 pages long and require you know, five to, five to 50 um, pieces of supporting documentation. Um, because she lost her benefits, Young was unable to afford her medication. She lost her food stamps. She struggled to pay her rent. She lost access to free transportation to medical appointments. And Omega Young died March 1, 2009. On the next day, March 2, she won an appeal for wrongful termination, and all of her benefits were restored. So that's the Indiana case. Um, I want to talk to briefly about the Allegheny County case, partially because there's been a, I've had a recent sort of exchange um, a couple of weeks ago. There was a piece written for the New York Times Sunday Magazine about this system, um, and I just um, published some excerpts from this chapter on Wired.com on Monday um, to sort of provide some balance to um, the perspective that that writer um, had on the system. Um, it's really interesting to look at the two together um, because we talked to many of the same people, and we were working in Pittsburgh at about the same time, but we come to very different conclusions about the system. So um, I recommend looking them up um, and seeing what you think. Um, so the system in Pittsburgh is uh, called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. Um, and the quick history of it is in um, 1999, uh, the Allegheny County Department of Human Services uh, commissioned this um, large data warehouse that collects data extracts from 29 um, county and state programs, including like juvenile and adult probation, um, the Pittsburgh Public Schools, the Police Department, the Office of Income Maintenance, so a lot of public programs. Um, in 2012, the office released an RFP um, funded by uh, some private backers, some foundation backers, um, to ask folks to propose projects that would mine this data to help the agency make more informed decisions around human services. Um, that contract went to Rima Vaitianathan, uh, or a, an international team led by Rima Vaitianathan from the University of Auckland and Emily Putnam Hornstein from USC um, to build the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, which is supposed to be able to predict which children will face um, abuse or neglect sometime in the future. Um, there, it's basically a statistical regression. It's not actually um, uh, AI or machine learning, though it's often written about as if it is. Um, and it's a model that's based on 131 factors that they found in the data warehouse that they believe are indicators of future maltreatment um, of children. And basically how it works is when a call comes in to the uh, Allegheny County hotline for child abuse and neglect, um, the intake workers will interview the caller. They, they have a high level access to the data warehouse, so they look through the data warehouse to provide a history. And then they make a decision on two factors. One is the, the risk they believe um, the allegation poses, um, whether or not it's um, actually child abuse or neglect uh, as defined by law. And the second is how safe they feel that child is. Um, once they make those two um, decisions, they run the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, which gives them a score, a risk score, from one being the lowest risk to 20 being the highest. Um, it shows up like on a thermometer looking thing on their screen. It's green at the bottom, red at the top. 
Um, and based on those three factors, um, the intake screener or them with their manager make a decision about whether or not to screen that case in for a, a full investigation um, by children, youth, and families. Often that's called Child Protective Services, but in um, Allegheny it's called CYF. Um, it is important to know that if the score is high enough, uh, it actually will automatically tr trigger uh, an investigation unless it's overridden by their supervisor. And I just want you to hear the voices of the families who are the targets of this quickly, and then we'll move to um, the conversation part. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about Angel Shepherd and Patrick Grebe. So I met Angel and Patrick at the Duquesne Family Support Center, which is one of 26 community hubs where families attend programs, access resources, and connect with others. Angel and Patrick didn't stand out right away because their experience is so utterly average, characteristic of the routine, mundane indignities experienced by many white working class people. They've um, struggled with low wage, dangerous work, with poor quality public schools and predatory online colleges, poor health and community violence. Um, though they're creative, involved parents, Angel and Patrick have racked up a lifetime of interactions with CYF. Patrick was investigated for medical neglect in the early 2000s when he was unable to afford his daughter Tabitha's antibiotic prescription after an emergency room visit. When Harriet, Angel's daughter, was five, someone phoned in a string of reports to the child abuse and neglect hotline. The anonymous tipster explained that Harriet was running around the neighborhood unsupervised, that she was down the block teasing a dog, that she wasn't being properly clothed, fed, bathed, and that she wasn't getting her anti-seizure medication. For each call, an investigator came to the house, interviewed Harriet and Tabitha, Angel and Patrick, looked in all the cupboards and under all the beds, and requested access to the family's medical records. And then each time, finding no evidence of maltreatment, they closed the case. Each of these interactions was entered into the family's case file, which is held in the integrated data warehouse, which feeds the AFST. Patrick and Angel live in terror that there'll be another call on their family and that the algorithm will target their daughter or granddaughter for investigation and possibly for removal to foster care. You feel like a prisoner, said Angel. You feel trapped. It's like no matter what you do, it isn't good enough for them. My daughter is now nine, and I'm still afraid that they're going to come up one day and see her out by herself, pick her up, and say, you can't have her anymore. So the reason I wanted to leave um, my part of the conversation on the Allegheny Family Screening Tool um, is uh, that it, it creates some real challenges for how many of us thinking about algorithmic discrimination are thinking about solutions. Um, many of the, the, um, the flaws in the system are flaws that we, we expect, right? So it uses proxies that are probably inappropriate. Um, it has a very laid, uh, limited data set um, that it is validated on, um, which only includes information about people who access public services, right? So if you get private, um, if you have private insurance for um, your mental health care or for your addiction um, care, that's not gonna end up in the database. Um, if you have uh, babysitters and nannies, um, they're not gonna end up in the database. If you're in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not gonna end up in the database. It's only gonna end up in the database um, if you ask, ask for help from county mental health services or you ask for help from a county supported alcohol um, and drug rehabilitation um, center, right? So these problems are the kinds of problems that we talk about a lot. The thing that I think is really challenging about the Allegheny Family Screening Tool is I call it in the book the best worst case scenario, um, which is they in fact have done everything that we ask them to do as people who write about data and discrimination. One, all the folks I talk to have really good intentions and are really smart people and really are care about what happens to poor kids and poor families. Um, two, the design of this tool was participatory. They held a series of community workshops. They talked to front, um, frontline caseworkers. They talked to foster parents. Um, they talked to community organizations um, about the model. They've been totally transparent about the model. They've released all of the information about it except for the weights of the predictive variables, which I'm still looking to get. Um, that they have not released, but we have a full list of the predictive variables, right? All the things we are concerned about when they're private algorithms that we don't have, are black boxes, we don't have access to the innards of. Um, and it's publicly owned, 
right? It's something that is controlled, at least in, in theory, by democratic um, processes. So where I want to sort of leave us as a place to talk um, as a larger group and between Alondra and Julia and myself is how do we respond when designers do everything we ask them to and still produce a system that I think is one of the most dangerous things I've ever seen in terms of the health of poor and working class families. So one, like how do we respond to that? And then the second question that I think we could talk about in a really productive way um, is why, if we're doing everything right, are we still producing systems that police punish and profile the poor? Um, so that's where I'd like to leave what I have to say, um, and I'd like to invite Julia and Alondra to come up um, and pepper us all with fascinating and incis insightful questions. Thank you so much. Thanks. So it's super great to be here. It's an honor to be um, with Virginia, whose work is so incredible. And um, just, it, I had an opportunity to read it already. You guys all should. But it is, um, it, the depth to which she goes is really great because um, it's rare to read something that has all the nuance about the good side, the bad side, the truly human, messy situations that are not easily encompassed um, in, you know, the academic thinking and theoretical thoughts about it, all of which are also great, but this is the true, like, on the ground, boots on the ground, and as a journalist, I love boots on the ground. <laughs> so, um, and then it's great to be here with Alondra, who has written so much about race and DNA and just has uh, bring a great um, perspective as Dean of Social Sciences at Columbia to this discussion. So I thought I would just kick it off with um, a fight that I have with my husband every day. <laughs> um, so my husband is very well-intentioned, lovely dude. And um, he spends all his time in Africa trying to bring you know, engineering solutions to, um, to poor people. And so any given day, he wakes up with a new surveillance scheme where he's like, okay, today we're going to fly drones all over Africa and we're going to survey the soil quality from the air. And then the farmers will be able to figure out, we can tell actually what would be the optimal thing to plant. We'll be able to improve yields, like food will, you know, increase and like, this is amazing. And I'm like, you're going to surveil all of Africa. Like I just wrote a book on, did you see my book about privacy and surveillance, honey? And, um, and then we have these fights. But the truth is, these are legitimate questions, right? Like, he wants to serve the poor, and he actually feels like you need the data. You need to know where they are and what they need. You know, he did a project where he looked at the aerial um, surveillance of all of Nigeria, and he was able to build a classifier and locate all their schools. They didn't know where all their schools were. They didn't know how many schools they had. So that's super helpful, assuming they actually provide services to those schools. So this is a question I'm sure you reach all the time, which is like, there are so many good things too, maybe, about surveillance of the poor, maybe. Um, how do we balance that? What do you think? And I can hand it to either one of you. Maybe you want to start. Yeah, I, I can start if that's OK. Um, it's your party. <laughs> So um, the, the way this comes up in my work um, is the very real acknowledgement that accessing public services is incredibly difficult. And if there are ways we can integrate systems to lower the barriers for people to access services, then that is a really positive thing, right? So if you want home heating assistance, it's a different office and a different application. And then if you want cash assistance, it's a different office. And that application is like 37 pages long. And if you want, yeah, child support, like that, that's a different office. And then you have to go to that office. And but it's incredibly difficult. To, and this is part of actually there's a line item in the public service budget called diversion, and the diversion budget is exactly for what it sounds like, which is to keep people from getting the entitlements that they should be getting by law. Um, and making the system so complicated that it's like impossible to navigate is a form of diversion. Um, whether that's intentional or not, it has the effect of diversion. So lowering barriers by integrating systems is really important. It's really crucial. That said, um, as someone who was a welfare rights organizer for 15 years and cares deeply about the survival of families on public assistance, um, it is sometimes necessary um, to stay less visible in these systems in order to survive and thrive 
um, to use them the way that um, they're actually intended to be used. So the problem with integration is that it then becomes really easy to track you across all of these different programs, right? So you track your behavior, track your spending, um, uh, track, uh, you know, with key fobs when you get into and leave public housing, right? Um, so it becomes very, you become hyper visible very, very quickly. And that hyper visibility really creates great harm for people um, because it involves them in a cycle. I didn't get a chance to talk about the case in Los Angeles, but involves them, it's really clear in that case, it involves folks in a cycle that can criminalize them very quickly. Um, and that's where I think this connects, this work also connects to some of the great work you've done around the criminal justice system, because once you get in that um, cycle, it can be very, very hard to get out. So one of the things that people said in Indiana, what that administrator said to me in Indiana was, oh, caseworkers don't like this new automated system because it requires them to follow all the rules to the letter, and that's just a cultural change that they're gonna have to get used to which I thought was really interesting because the moment I talked about as the rise of the digital poorhouse, actually at that point, caseworkers had enough discretion that there was literally a drawer of cash in the office and if somebody was having a really tough time, they could just reach in the cash drawer and hand that family cash money, right? And like that's such a different, I'm not saying it's good, bad or indifferent that there was the cash drawer, right? But just think about what a different political moment that is where caseworkers were trusted enough that we said, you know what, you know what's happening, like you, we trust your discretion on this, and that um, people receiving benefits were trusted enough that we just handed them cash, right? This is a really different political moment than the political moment we're in, and that's one of the things that really makes me nervous about, evidence is great, we love evidence of good programs that work, um, but evidence um, that creates uh, specific interventions for specific people also can be used to persecute. Um, and that is the, that's the flip side of personalization in policy is, is the possibility for persecution. And so I think we always have to be thinking about both of those things. How'd I do? That's a joke? Great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to just, uh, well, I want to salute you, Virginia, because I, this book is extraordinary and it's, um, um, not only do you do a tremendous job of storytelling about the people that you encounter, but you do a tremendous job of narrating how the technology works, right, actually. So it's actually, it's, that's very difficult to do, actually. And you come away from these chapters actually um, knowing how algorithms work and how you know, evidence-based decisions are, ma are made through the process. So um, I want to salute you for that as well. Um, I guess I would want us to, to, one of the takeaways from your book to be a sense of revived empowerment around sort of automated technologies. I mean, I think that we, there's a spectrum from, you know, magic and mystique to, to complete disempowerment. And I think that what your approach, because you kind of have this orthogonal approach to the one that we usually take, which is, which is what sort of wonkish smart people do, which is like, we're gonna audit the algorithms, we're gonna reverse engineer. Um, and sort of fairly, it seems fairly obvious, but it's not because we're caught in the mystique and magic is like, why don't you actually see what it does to people's lives? <laughs> and think about it that way. And so what I find um, so great about your work is that it, that's, that approach to what automation does is available to much many more people, right? You don't have to just have a battalion of highly skilled people, although we need that battalion as well, including Julia and her, her colleagues at ProPublica. We are doing the wonky thing. Yeah, no, I mean, look, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor. There's flatter room, a lot of love for wonks, a lot of love for wonks. <laughs> But I just wanted, you know, that tilt and register that you offer, I think, for public discourse around automated technologies, I think will be a game changer. It, all, it all gives us a, another kind of place to enter the conversation. So to go back to, and then um, to open back up the conversation, but to go back to your example, Julia, what I think is so interesting about the drones and the, sur the aerial surveillance is that, you know, we do have technologies that we will say it's okay to use it here and it's not okay to use it there. But because we're on, we're in this kind of <coughs> mystical world of data where we feel so disempowered, we feel like we can't even make ask for those normative constraints, right? So it's okay to use your phone call, your phone, you know, in most places. It's not okay to illegally record someone without telling them. 
you know, and that's a kind of, you know, that's an old fashioned example. And I don't know if there's other analogs, but it, we should be able um, as sort of communities of thinkers and as social communities to come up with something that says it's OK to do aerial surveillance if you're trying to help a community figure out how many schools they have. Um, and you don't have other ways to figure that out, and we want to aggregate that data and really think about the kinds of investments that we want to make in education in, you know, in Nigeria. Um, but it's not okay to use that same surveillance to, you know, um, as an extractive technology to find out where resources are that are owned by other people or something, right? Um, and that we should, you know, I would love part of the conversation to come out of certainly your work, but Virginia's work, to be a reanimation of our power um, as citizens and scholars around the ability to sort of make normative, to demand normative constraints, whether or not we can make them or enact them. Mm. Oh, I like that, how you flipped it into from hopelessness to hope, because uh, I kind of veer towards one edge of that. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I wanted to um, talk about, which I think comes it, so, through this book is this idea of the deserving poor. That so much of this technology is about sorting out who is deserving and who is not. And, um, you know, it's a real challenge. It reminds me of the new Jim Crow where she talks about how the advocates are forced into this position of trying to find the perfect victim to show that this discrimination is bad. When in fact, like co the collective harm, although it is harder to describe, is actually the real harm, right? Um, and so, it's like, you know, the harm isn't just putting one innocent person away, it's criminalizing an entire sector of society and locking them up, right? And so I have this challenge in journalism. You know, I, I do all this wonky stuff that, you know, is like whatever, trying to reverse engineer an algorithm successfully or not, um, and then publishing it, but my editors, and this is a just journalism trope, is like we have to find the perfect victim, right? Like we have to, it has to, for it to be sympathetic. It has to be like the most heart-rending story. And of course, I, I get that. And it's sort of, that's the, the narrative trope. But it is also a trap, right? And I, I would love to hear your thoughts about it because you don't have to work for my editors. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> for good or for bad, um, that is true. Um, so yeah, I think that actually starts to answer part of the question that I ended my bit of the talk on, which is like, how do we keep producing these tools even when there's good intentions and good process? How do we keep producing these tools that cause great harm to poor and working families? Um, and part of the reason is because often folks who have not um, been first person experiencers of public assistance assume that the goal of the system is to make sure that people get the benefits that they're entitled to by law. But in fact, that's never been the way the system has worked. Um, and Yasha Monk actually uh, has a great new book called The Age of Responsibility, where he basically says, like, look, the, the, we spend all of our time, all of our energy, and all of our money um, basically trying to decide whether or not it's your fault that you're poor rather than creating a floor under folks which would allow them to unleash their incredible human potential, right? Oh, I hear snapping. Thank you for the snapping. Um, that, that touches me deeply, thank you. Um, and um, I think part of the reason that we keep producing these tools is to like paraphrase Ingrid Bergington on predictive policing, we're, we're just, we have the same system we've always had, just faster and with more math. And so like my solutions in this book are often very frustrating for folks because people really want me to like write down the 10 point plan for creating good technologies and public services. And I keep having to say like, well, the 10 point plan is point one, join a social movement <laughs> where the goal is to end poverty everywhere and forever create massive cultural change in how people understand themselves as poor and see it as a majority experience, right? Two thirds of us in the United States will access a means tested public benefit at some point in our lives. Two thirds of us, that is the majority. That's a winning majority on any political battle. If we can admit to each other that we have done it, uh, which most of us don't. And I'll tell a very fast but very funny story about this, which is, so I've been a welfare rights organizer for 15 years, and I've always um, described myself in this work as an ally um, who is not, has not ever been on public assistance, but I believe very strongly in public assistance for blah, 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 blah all these reasons. Um, I went like a couple of weeks ago um, to a conference where somebody talked about Lifeline, Universal Lifeline, which there's a ton to talk about. We won't do that tonight. It's important, support it, protect it. 
Um, and I was talking to her about Universal Lifeline, and I was like, oh yeah, I was on Universal Lifeline for years. And then like 20 minutes later, I was like, oh, I was totally on welfare. Right? It is a welfare program. It's a means-tested welfare program. I was on welfare. I am a welfare rights organizer who had said for 15 years I'd never been on welfare. Like that is how deep our like cultural denial of our use of public services is. Is that someone who like literally it was my job to think about helping people identify as <laughs> welfare recipients and I didn't realize I had been on welfare, right? Like it's that deep. So that cultural change has to happen. Political changes have to happen around how we think about um, uh, public assistance as providing a floor rather than a moral thermometer. And then in the meantime, we need to come up with technical plans for causing less harm because these tools based in this culture and this po political moment um, have great potential for atrocity, I, I, I say in the book. Um, and so a change has to happen on all three of those um, registers at the same time. And I know that's super frustrating because you just want me to say like use Python instead of C++, <laughs> right? Or like talk to users, um, right? You want me to say that. And I mean, that's good too. I don't know about the Python versus C++, but do talk to users, it's really good. But that doesn't mean that even folks who are receiving public assistance aren't gonna say, oh, I'm the only person using this correctly and everybody else is on the take because there's a lot of horizontal violence in that system. So you should, because I'm not getting mine because they're all cheating. So you should surveil us, right? Like, so there's all this work that has to happen before we can produce systems that are less harmful um, and create fewer economic inequalities. Um, and it's hard, hard work. Um, there's optimistic moments around that, that that work is starting to happen. And I'm happy to talk about that later, but I want Alondra to jump in. Um, do you mind if I steal Please. before? I was just gonna say the thing you talk about um, is the, what is called the people's, poor people's campaign as sort of a model maybe um, for collective action, which was um, oh, a long time ago, yes. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was um, to think about what Alondra has written about how, you know, the Black Panthers had built this network of free healthcare. And this idea that maybe providing services to the poor is a revolutionary act and like, uh, it seems like maybe that's one of the starting points as well. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but interesting, I mean, I think, you know, look, to be poor is to be stigmatized, to be black is to be stigmatized, and so there are no deserving poor. I mean, there, there are, you know, so to act like that, that is even a clause that sort of makes sense um, in our world, you know, a phrase that makes sense is to, um, I think not be realistic about what we're facing. So I didn't mean to sound too hopeful, but I felt in your book, um, uh, and, and Virginia's book, I'm not dialing back, but you know, in Virginia's book, a sort of pocket of negotiation, right? I mean, because I think that we're, op you know, the alternative is often a kind of sense of paralysis. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe we can talk about this later, but one of the things that's fascinating in your book are, both in both your, in both the um, uh, digital dead end in this book are people who know that their behaviors are being accounted for numerically in a system, and so they are making choices and you know in a conversation that's saying like if I do this or if I go here, it's going to make my score higher or lower, or if I go do this in your earlier book, it's going to mean that I'm going to have this kind of encounter with a welfare service worker and these sorts of things. So this is just worth thinking about. Um, but, you know, I think that the Panthers offer, oddly, you know, I think social movements always offer us the, you know, examples because they're oriented to the future and they're oriented to imagining that that the norm does not, the status quo does not, is not all there is. Um, and, um, you know, so the Black Panthers, the health clinics, yes. I mean, I think, you know, a closer example is the work that they did around, um, a uh, sickle cell anemia around genetic disease at a time when we didn't know that much about genetics as a kind of larger society. And y the strategy here, um, and maybe this gets at your three sort of interventions, Virginia, that we would need to work on the kind of three scales of, of change, um, was that they needed to have trusted experts, right? So that like, you know, we are, you know, a lot of college students, but we're not genetic scientists, right? Um, and so um, we need a sort of um, cohort of people that we can trust um, to help us understand this technology and help our communities understand the technology. Um, but we get to make the decisions about how we narrate what the story is around these technologies. Um, and I think more to the point, we want to be engaged and educated in conversation about them, right? And so, so that's one of the takeaways. But another is that, um, 
y you know, that, the, that these communities, and you do a good job of this in your book, understood that they could understand. So they're not gonna understand at a level of, you know, writing a sort of algorithmic calculation, but there's a sense of, of understanding, and I think that's what your book conveys very much about how they're caught in a kind of algorithmic system, um, how their behaviors sort of have outcomes in that system, um, and, you know, how there are moments where they can try to sort of get around them. Um, and so I think that that's an interesting um, analog. Yeah, I have a a, a great concrete example of that. Um, and I just also want to say wonderful things about body and soul. Um, and we're just having a love fest up here. But it's a, it's a much deserved love fest. Um, because I think this sort of history of survival projects of the Panthers um, is uh, so incredibly important, right? We have a tendency to think of the Panthers as the guys standing by the window with, um, with guns. Um, but they were also like the guys and ladies um, walking kids across crosswalks um, or creating crosswalks where there are no crosswalks before and creating um, uh, school breakfast and lunch programs and uh, fighting sickle cell and doing health programs and I think that we often don't tell stories of our movements that um, that really take this um, uh, I'm gonna call on Sandy Schramm here too hi Sandy um, uh, Sandy does a great thing where he talks about the politics of survival and the politics of social change and how crucial those two are to each other not only because you have to survive up until the revolution happens, but that survival projects actually bring you all the right information about what's wrong. Like that's how you actually find out what the problems are is by meeting people in terms of their basic daily needs. And those needs have shifted a little bit, right? And I'd actually say that control over our data and our self-determination around who gets to tell our stories are now a very basic human need that is under attack. Um, but I, I would, this is one of the reasons I was so excited that Alondra was gonna be here, is that I really wanna think about what do those survival projects look like now? And a lot of them still look like, you know, um, health programs and school lunches and um, crossing guards, but some of them now also have to look like, uh, let's have a workshop where we sit down and look at the survey that's used by the coordinated entry system that ranks unhoused people on a scale of zero to 17 uh, based on how vulnerable they are and then um, gives prioritized access to resources if you reach a certain vulnerability threshold, right? Um, a survival project in this case could look like we get together, we sit down and look at the survey, which is available on the internet, and we strategize together like, how do you get the highest score possible without incriminating yourself, right? And there's ways that I could tell you right now how to do that. Um, and the folks that I worked with knew it. Like, it's, they spend a lot of, unhoused people spend a lot of time in the public library, and they will download stuff, and they will talk about it. Um, and so people already knew this, and we're already making, exactly like Alondra said, already making these calculations about how do I um, get as close to getting the resources that every human being deserves by dint of having a belly button, right? Like that is the rule for housing. Um, do you deserve housing? Do you have a belly button? Then you deserve housing, right? So they all assume that that's um, the vulnerability threshold. If you're unhoused, you deserve housing. Um, and then we'll strategize around how to get the closest they can to accessing that basic human need. Um, and so I think one of the big picture things there is talking to people closest to the problems is the way you find the most creative, interesting, and I think um, the folks most invested in solutions. Um, and I just wanna um, highlight right now, I'm really privileged to work with a, um, a, a national, international group of folks right now on a project called the Our Data Bodies Project. Um, and we're working in three cities across the United States, um, Detroit, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Los Angeles to talk to marginalized um, neighborhoods about their experience with the, the, the collection, sharing, and use of their data. And one of the things we ask a lot about is, um, tell us about your self-defense strategies. Um, and this comes out of an organization in LA called the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition um, that talks about this work as moving people from um, uh, paranoia to power. And part of that is understanding um, what you're facing, but, um, and, but, uh, but also understanding that that often means confirming people's worst fears that like, yeah, they know when you leave and le come in and leave public housing, right? And yeah, they know, like they have a picture of you that they share with 168 different organizations. So how do you do that political work, that organizing work without just people diving for tinfoil hats and being like, that's it, I'm out. 
Because certainly the goal of this work is not to say don't try to access food stamps. Like if you need supplemental nutrition assistance, you should get it, right? But people should be aware too of what, the, what systems they're becoming involved in. So we talk to people a lot about their self-defense um, uh, strategies around this. And I want um, that project to be able to release their incredible results, which will happen in March. Um, so stay tuned. Um, but I will say that people have brilliant strategies for survival and for self-defense and for community defense that are already being um, being deployed. And that they don't need, I, I, again, it's great to have ex experts that you can trust to help, but that most people don't actually need that. They have a really good instinct for what's happening. They may not have all the right names for everything, um, but they know, they, they see, right? They're like, well, first I talked to this person, and then that person showed up at public housing, and then the cops stopped me a week later. They're like, so those systems are talking to each other, right? Um, it's kind of like professional middle class people shopping for something on Zappos and finding an ad on Facebook, right? But it's in real life, right? Um, it's in, in your house. Um, so there, yeah, there are, there are amazing, um, self-defense stuff out there already. We just have to be having the conversation in a, a more open way. I think we're gonna, Dana's gonna go around and get your questions, so. So just a reminder that this is being videotaped. It's also being live streamed. Your question will go out on live stream. If you wanna remove it for the video, um, just let us know, but otherwise it'll be recorded. Who's got a question? <laughs> So I've been kind of stuck on this example that you gave when you were reading from your book earlier when you were talking about this um, family who was being investigated and, you know, in that case it seemed like they weren't really a risk for child abuse and this investigation was kind of hurting them. Um, but I'm trying to imagine kind of what an alternative would be, like what an alternative system that would get children the support that they need without ever making this type of mistake would look like. And it, it seems like for any system I could imagine, there's always going to be some family like this that you could go to and get this heart-wrenching story. And you know, that's going to be the case whether algorithms are involved or whether it's just people who are coming up with these decisions on their own. So you know, do you think that this is really something that's worsened by having algorithms involved? Or you know, are things hopeless just no matter what? Or, you know, Basically, why is this worse coming from algorithms than coming from people? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of like clarifying things about folks who haven't interacted with um, child protective services or child, youth, and families um, often don't know some really basic stuff around them. Um, so one thing is that 75% of investigations um, involve neglect and not physical, sexual, um, or emotional abuse. Um, and it's very, very hard to tell the difference between the basic conditions of being a poor family um, and neglect, right? Because um, not having enough food, not having adequate housing, um, not having someone to watch your kids when you go to work, those are all um, neglect uh, under the child protective um, services system. Um, so that's really important to understand. Um, it's also really important to understand that child protective services tend to combine two roles that maybe would be better off separated, um, which is um, they are the service provider of last resort for poor families. So if you can't access um, how, um, public housing because the wait list for Section 8 is 600 years long, um, then it's actually not unusual to fam for families to call child protective services on themselves in order to try to access resources um, that uh, you would hope they would, could be able to get without involving themselves in the system. Um, and I think the answer to your question really revolves around um, what you believe about the discretion of frontline caseworkers. And that is actually a really complicated thing because frontline caseworkers have um, been the source of gr uh, huge amounts of discrimination in the public service system and in foster care um, and in CPS. Um, they're also um, the person who can bend the rules for you to protect your family without falling um, under this like really incredibly invasive punitive system of child abuse investigation. So I know, um, you know, caseworkers who uh, will, um, who have, um, uh, I'm forgetting the word for it, but basically said like, yes, there's a concern here in order to force a landlord to make a repair to somebody's house, right? 
The problem then is once you're in the system, um, you have this list of requirements um, that is actually really um, hard even for well-resourced families to reach. And failing on any one of those requirements can mean that your child um, is, is um, taken and put in foster care in, until you can reach that. So the, one of the major problems there is this mix of resource provider of last support and police and punisher of, of families. Um, and I really think pri like the primary solution in CPS is to separate those two roles. That, that, like the primary solution is to make sure we have a social service system that means that people aren't calling on themselves because they don't have enough food to keep their families fed and safe. Um, so, but the question you ask about why the algorithm's worse, um, I think, uh, this is my interpretation, um, I think that the algorithm is worse than human caseworkers um, because it relies on this philosophy that sees human decision making as a black box that we can't understand. Like, we can't possibly know how caseworkers are making decisions unless we collect all this data and run this regression, right? and sees the computer somehow as being open and transparent. When in fact, all the algorithm has done is move human discretion from the level of the mostly working class caseworkers to the engineers and data scientists who built the model, right? And so I think it's based on some really troubling ideas about who has bias, um, how bias operates, like that it's only individual, it's only like, I don't like Alondra because blah, blah, blah. And it's not systemic and built into our society and our institutions, right? So um, yeah, I do think the algorithm is worse, and I think it's worse because it hides the bias and because it um, makes assumptions about bias that I don't find intuitive or true. Right. Does that answer your question? Just one more. Yeah, yeah. Just one point. It's not an answer to this question, but one of the things that your work points out so clearly is also that there that there's there's this all of this variation um, and automation, the effects of automation. So part of what's happening with the caseworkers is that they're being de-skilled, yeah. right? So they're being sort of put. You know, this is so. You know, you could have a kind of future of work conversation about the caseworkers, but you're showing this sort of two-tiered or kind of two-level thing in which the de-skilling then is also creating all of these other, you know automated inequalities for the people with whom they work. So it's really, um, I think, I hope that the book will con contribute to us having a more complicated conversation about um, what automation means for, for the future of the labor force. Yeah. I'm gonna jump into yeah. really fast, just because I get this question all the time about the work I've done on criminal risk scores. So the prediction so software that I analyzed with my colleagues, it gives people a score one through 10 and whether they're likely to commit a future crime. And we showed that it was biased towards um, giving high scores unjustifiably to black defendants. And everyone has said to me, the first question, well, judges are just as biased, right? And like the truth is, it's very hard to do an apples to apples comparison because I would have to just check every judge in the US or run it against the software. So I don't have an answer to that, whether they are or not. But let's say they are. The difference is that this con like concretely systemized is the bias so that there's no way out of it. Right, with a judge, it's like you get a good judge, you get a bad judge, at least you have some odds. <laughs> Maybe you can judge shop if you're really lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and so systematizing the bias, knowing it's there and then just like leaving it mm -hmm. to run forever is also a huge harm. I'm really struck listening to you that um, we are all going to be increasingly living in a world where we don't have a lot of privacy unless we have incredible means to avoid surveillance, whether that's technological skill or whether it's the money to buy that. And the kind of question, can any of us live successfully under surveillance of that kind? Is it even possible to be innocent when investigated at that level? Do we ever live a life that doesn't break some rules? And if we, is this kind of the canary <laughs> in the coal mine a bit about the way we're all going to live when this is never more than a few feet from us? Um, and I often think I could happily live in a world where we all knew everything about everyone. It's not my first choice, but I think I could live in that world if it was truly symmetric. But in a world where it's not symmetric and there are powerful actors that know everything who don't want anyone to know anything about them, what does this say about all of us and our ability to live under surveillance? 
I, Julia really wants in on this one. Uh, so I'm going to be really fast. Uh, but I want to say two things that I think are really important. One is with the folks that I worked with um, who are um, receiving homeless services or receiving public assistance or who are interacting with the Child, Youth, and Family Services system, privacy is not language that resonates for them. Um, really what they're talking about is something different, which is self-determination. They often feel like they're forced to trade one of their basic human rights um, for um, another basic human right. So they're forced to trade away um, being self-determining about sharing their information for access to food. They're forced to um, uh, give away, uh, give the state um, the right to judge their parenting um, for a safer apartment, right? So they're always feeling like these systems put them in a, a, a place where they have to choose between their different human rights. Um, and that's really a power question. It's really about self-determination and power, not about privacy. Um, that said, I will also say that people have been incredibly generous with me. One of the reasons um, that I started doing this work was very, very early in 2000 when I was doing the Digital Dead End book, um, I was speaking to a young mother on public assistance about her electronic benefits transfer card, her EBT card, um, which is where you get your benefits on this ATME like card now. Um, and we were talking about it and um, I was saying, oh yeah, a lot of people say that they love these. And she's like, oh, there's things that are great about it. But you know, at the same time, it allows my caseworker to track every single one of the purchases I make. And I had this like shocked professional middle class white girl face on. I was like, what? Uh, and she laughed at me for a while. Um, and then very generously, she said, you know, you should pay it. You meaning professional middle class people should pay attention to what's happening to us because you're next. And one of the arguments I do make in the book is it's very easy if we build a world um, based on our contempt and hatred for poor and working class people, everyone has to live in that world. Um, and the, the digital tools are very easy to flip on. Right now, the, the most punitive, the stickiest strands of the digital poorhouse web, the most densely woven strands are around poor and working class communities. Um, but, uh, I mean, particularly in the political moment we're in now, as there's going to be a tax against disability, there's going to be a tax against the SSI, there's going to be a tax against Social Security, right? Um, that's a system that's very easy to port to other folks. So even if you don't care about the basic moral right of poor and working class people to live full lives, and you should, um, even if you don't, you should care out of self-interest uh, um, about, about these things. Um, so... I'm only jumping in just because I wrote an entire book on this topic. I'm so sorry. But, um, <laughs> but I'm going to be so fast. But I guess all I would say is that for to try to understand what the future might look like in that world, I went to Germany and went through the Stasi archives. And I felt like that really was a great illustration. So I read a lot of files about, um, there are only some that could be made available to the public, so I, I managed to get a few of them. And they're published on my website, I've translated them. But what you really see is that there's something on everyone. Basically, if, you, if they took the time to go after you, they found something. It was always, my, it could be very minor, but what they did was they used that to flip you. So that's why one in eight people was an informant in East Germany, right? So it was incredibly corrosive to society. Um, and so I think that that is back to this question that it's really about power, right? The way they used their power was to make everyone turn on each other. And that is something that I think we should all be worried about. Yeah. Alondra, you want to take a stab at this or should we move on? Um, so I, I keep coming back to this notion of, of how complex the road ahead looks, mm -hmm. um, but also specifically getting back to the deserving uh, language. What struck me was in response to, to Trump's shithole comment, for example, when, when we think about who's coming to help figure this out, we, we can fault the design, we can, you know, there's a lot of blame to go there, but there, I also think about the allies in this, mm -hmm. and one of the conversations that happened was, in the wake of that, were there were, there were a lot of black people, I'm black, for those on, who can't see me, um, who talked about their exceptionalism, um, talked about the education they have, and so when I think about how entrenched this notion of moving away f from poor is, it makes me wonder who's lined up to do the work of actually 
getting us to the next point. Mm -hmm. And I guess I keep coming back, I think it was Baynard Rustin in the wake of the, the uh, March on Washington who said, you know, all these people signed up and maybe 10% of them ended up showing up. And so I keep coming back to who is showing up yeah. and, and how, do we, how do we work around that? Yeah. That's a great question. And, and one that I hope we can li leave in a fairly optimistic place. So I do wanna say that I think a lot of the work of um, redefining poverty so people s um, identify with poor as a political identity is actually really important work and it's happening really strong right now. Um, so it's been happening for decades. The Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign has been doing this work since the 80s and 90s. More recently, um, Reverend Barber um, has called for a revival on the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, of the Poor People's Campaign, a moral, oh, I'm not going to remember the subtitle, I'll get in trouble, um, a moral call for something, something. Um, so there's some really incredible work happening around thinking about poverty as a political identity. Um, I think on the other side, there's some really incredible work about thinking about database discrimination um, and algorithmic harm. I am not seeing a lot of bridges being built across those two spaces right now. And it's something that in, so my next project, I shouldn't say this out loud, I hope my next project um, is gonna be a dual biography. My agent's giving me the stink eye right now. Um, it, I hope will be a dual biography of Sherry Honkala of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign and of the American Poor People's Movement in this moment because I do think there's something that can be called that. And folks, when I've started to do the interviews around this, um, I'm like, oh, this is a total departure from my old work. And they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> and they're like, we think about this stuff all the time, right? So folks are thinking about it, but we haven't quite done the ally, the, the coalition building work that needs to happen where we see that we have um, shared struggles not the same struggle, not the same experience. We're all in our own identity and in our own struggle, but that we have shared um, struggle. And I think that that work is starting to happen, um, but I hope my book can help push that a little bit farther. One of the places that I hope my book will help push a little bit is, I mean, one of the places that this work is happening in a really visible and really exciting way is around um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the fight against police brutality and police violence. Um, one of the, the um, invitations, I hope, that this book um, offers is to think about policing in a slightly different way, that it's not something that's just done by law enforcement, but that policing happens in all of these different public agencies. And one of the most frightening sentences I've ever written um, to have read by the public is in this book, and it, I, I say at some point, um, you know, the state doesn't need a cop to kill you right, um, that many of the systems that I study, you know, kill people, um, and that we have to start seeing state violence as something that is, um, that happens in um, places beyond policing, which is not to say take our eyes off the badge, that work is really important. Um, but we also have to be thinking about how those processes are happening in child protective services and in welfare and in um, um, homeless services and in all these other places that, that happens. And I think we're really close. I feel really optimistic about where it is, but we're not quite there yet. So maybe you and I together can do it. And Alondra. Hi, oh, I love your work, so thanks so much for, for doing that. Especially, I think, for me, one of the key points is this is being practiced on the poor and the technologies are being codified in the systems. And of course, it's gonna go everywhere else. Um, so just, uh, but I'd love to get your comment on, um, I, I had occasion by various coincidences to visit an HRA office in New York City in the past couple of months. That's welfare offices for people who don't know. And um, I was shocked. <laughs> at the visible t amount of technology and the display of it. If you haven't been to one lately, they're all over the city and it's easy to g just walk in there. Um, they, there's like, they had this elaborate take a number system. It had weird lighting. It looked like a fancy schmancy retail outfit, uh, 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 like outlet. It had a person, the UI was so bad that they actually had a person who had to stand there next to you and tell you what buttons to push because nobody could figure out what the next thing was to do. Um, uh, it was full, full video surveillance a lot, a lot of visible security. And so I thought to myself, well, a couple of things was, what happens to that data? When I say data in this case, for example, it's full video surveillance. 
they can play that back. They can trace it. They can be like, oh, that person really pissed me off. Let's get it. What, who is that? And various things can happen with it. I don't know. The other thing that happened was I walked out of the building, and there were people there, just like you know how people might try to sell you a cell phone in New York or something, a little stand, and there were like a couple of young people like freezing outside. And they were like, oh, would you like a phone? It's a free phone. And I was like, what is the free phone? Because I didn't know this. So if you are on public assistance in various ways, you can get these free phones, which now we know that phones are kind of a place where you can track various things. So anyway, I, I just wanted to get your take on like, I mean, the, just the latest basically that it didn't, I didn't see an algorithm running around, but I saw all this stuff. <laughs> They're there, yeah. Um, I oh, just want to just to link to this point. I mean, I, I just that's a, a a wonderful example about how allyship gets very complicated, and we have to be really honest about what allyship has to look like in that moment, and it or in the moment at which decisions are being you know caseworkers are being deskilled and the decisions are being made by data scientists. It's just not the same, and it's a different. It's going to take a different kind of political um, work um, and a different kind of imagination of what allies look like. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, a, a very quick response to that is just really about um, how I, one of the ways I came to this work. Um, so I came up as an organizer in the Community Technology Center movement, really believed, this is what my book Digital Dead, Digital Dead End is about, um, if people are interested in this part of my work. Um, very much believe that access to technology was um, one of the most important social justice issues of our time. I still believe that that's true. Um, I worked mostly with youth who were totally on board, who were totally like, yeah, bring the internet. Um, and then I switched to moving, um, w uh, working with poor and working class grown women. Um, and they had a very much more complicated relationship with technology. And one of the things they were really clear about with me after I had been there for a while, they kind of intervened on my research. And they were like, hey, Virginia, guess what? Everything you're asking us is, has nothing to do with our lives and is totally boring. And that's why no one's coming to your stuff. And I was like, oh. Thanks. Um, I appreciate the input. Um, and luckily, I was there long enough to be able to say, like, hey, if these are bad questions, what are the better questions? And they were a really generous community of people who shared their perspective with me. And one of their major critiques is everybody tells us we don't have access to technology. Have you walked into a welfare office? Because it is bristling with technology. Um, and a low wage workforce is bristling with technology. And the criminal justice system is bristling with technology. In fact, technology is completely ubiquitous in our lives. That doesn't mean we have power vis-a-vis -vis this technology, right? So that the question really wasn't about, like, do you have access, but was do you, do you have power? And that's the, really the insight that started me on all of this work between uh, the EBT card comment and that, that that's really where, where my mark starts. So I think, and that's why I think it's so interesting to look at these sites uh, where power is being played out in these very sort of bald terms, like the welfare office, like the criminal justice system, um, like homeless services, is because the issues become so concrete. Um, it's really easy for this work to be abstract, but it's impossible for it to be abstract when you're looking in a prison, in a high-tech prison, or you're looking in the welfare office. It's, um, it's, it's very concrete, and I think that's an important um, part of why I do the work I do. Please, let's give a huge round of applause. <laughs> to the